Well, it is a daunting honour to be chairing the first full session of this conference, though the weight of responsibility seems slightly less now. We've already had a, a, an introduction, introductory and stimulating session zero, so to speak, to get the juices flowing. Uh, a third of a century ago, I spent three days wandering the environs of Plataea, trying to make some sort of sense of the theatre of operations, ending up, to borrow the words of a colleague about a lecture on numismatics, just as confused, but on a much higher level. The level is surely, surely going to rise further over these three days, but who knows, perhaps the confusion will dissipate. Certainly the three colleagues uh, who are now going, uh, three, three colleagues in this panel are certainly going to do their best to that end on three topics that share a focus on things. Our first contributor is Dr. Van der Rook Huizen. I hope I pronounced that something like correctly, who is a postdoc at Utrecht University. He's the author of Herodotus and the Topography of Xerxes' Invasion, Place and Memory in Greece and Anatolia in 2018, a study which stresses the role that monuments, temples, and natural landmarks played in the recollection or reimagining of what happened during Xerxes' invasion. He's currently working on the symbolism, archaeology, and Rezeptionsgeschichte of the Athenian Acropolis, a notable locus for Xerxes too, of course, but also for so many other people in the Western cultural tradition. Today, however, we are back with the Lieu de Mémoire of the Xerxes invasion, and specifically with the topography of Plataea. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Tuplin. I hope I am audible right now for everyone. Great. I will share my uh, screen as well. Is this visible? Yes, great. So I'm grateful to Natasha for, first of all, organizing this conference and then also for inviting me to be part of it. And also for allowing me to revisit uh, my previous research into the topography of, of the battle. And I'm looking forward to stimulating discussions which have already started. In my paper, I would like to give some theoretical considerations into topographical narratives and then also virtually visit the uh, battlefield with you. My main point will be that, yes, we can go to Plataea to attempt to locate the battlefield, but at the same time, we should be also very cautious with relying on the topographical narrative that has come down to us. And especially in the work of Herodotus, who seems to be giving us more memory about the battle than history about the battle in some aspects, at least. And that relates to what Professor Cartledge was just uh, discussing. And I think he also mentioned the groundbreaking uh, article by Watley about the Battle of Marathon. And so that also relates to the Battle of Plataea, I think. So this study was part of my larger doctoral project in which I've attempted to look at the battle topographies of Xerxes' invasion as described by Herodotus from a memory perspective. And I thought that that was worthwhile because I, and probably many, many of you as well, love this sensation of, uh, this historical sensation of going to a battlefield and then having the sense that it all took place there and that um, yeah, something very important happened there. And uh, I think Yanis uh, Kadolu just uh, mentioned that uh, there will be reenactors going to Plataea, to the battlefield this summer. So that's going to be an amazing experience that I perhaps uh, there, we can also know when that's gonna, going to take place. I would love to see. But upon reading about ancient battles, I noticed that in earlier scholarship, uh, there was sometimes a tendency of taking these battle topographies that we have as unproblematic material to reconstruct ancient battles in a spatial sense. Even if the topography of the battle was and can be reconstructed from later texts such as uh, Plutarch and Pausanias, Herodotus's histories is of course central for us. And this text was treated as a gold mine for clues that would give us direct insight into how the battle had proceeded. But was that approach valid? Of course, there has always been a certain sense that Herodotus is not an infallible uh, guide to the Persian Wars. 
But as the typical excuse went, veterans of the wars were in the time of Herodotus still alive to correct him and to check him. So on the whole, Herodotus provided an accurate uh, reflection on the war, it was thought. And sometimes the topography was even seen as the most reliable information to be gleaned from uh, the ancient text. After all, even if the armies were long gone, the landscape itself was still there, allowing us members of posterity to verify the narrative on the ground. And thus maps like the one I'm showing you here could be produced. And they, uh, many of them were produced also in later times. The topographical investigation started early and perhaps unsurprisingly, some early students of the battle were themselves military. Colonel William Leake had served in the army and had a passion for topography. Central for Plataea was Kendrick Pritchett, who himself was a captain in the US uh, um, Army Air Corps during the Second World War. His uh, studies in ancient Greek topography, which appeared in eight parts uh, from the 1960s onwards, is still a most valuable reference. It was his aim to defend the veracity of Herodotus by studying the site itself. And he even published a book in 1993 called The Liar School of Herodotus, in which he attacked those who questioned the reliability of Herodotus. And he didn't talk uh, that much about the Battle of Plataea in that book. But again, he says there that topography is the certain means to verify the ancient author. Even so, the reconstruction of the battle in these plains was difficult because there were very few landmarks that could with absolute certainty be identified with uh, the places described by Herodotus. And in uh, this particular case, the changed hydrology of the uh, battlefield exacerbated that situation. So a great puzzle unfolded. And I would say that it became the biggest topographical puzzle of concerned with Xerxes' invasion. And maybe, especially because it became such a puzzle, it, uh, the reconstruction of this, of this battlefield became all the more alluring. Now, my own approach to study the battle topography has been a, a slightly different. I moved from the idea that texts such as those of Herodotus do not always give us perfect insight into the actual battle topography, because it can be I recognize that by the time that Herodotus worked on, on his book, uh, let's say in the 430s, already so much time had elapsed, maybe 50 years, that a process of commemoration had started in which the topography of the battle may have been radically transformed in the recollections of Herodotus' informants. And I want to um, stress the enormously important work of uh, Georgia Proietti in, in the regard of reconstructing the memory of the Persian Wars in the fifth century. Now, this can be a little bit of a depressing thought for us because if we take away the reliability in a topographical sense, our um, best source, because Herodotus of course remains our best source, then what are we left with? Now, I do not say that the reconstruction of where the battle happened is a fruitless exercise because there was a real battle and there is a real battlefield. And perhaps archeological material evidence for the battle is still lurking in the fields. And I gladly leave that task to the archeologists to discover those uh, source or those uh, traces. But if we focus on the topography as a collection of places of memory, then uh, we open up new vantage points and questions like, why do these uh, places feature in the first place? And what stories were being remembered there and why? Now, some theory. From the mid 20th century onward, studies have appeared in which places of memory are recognized and explained as cultural phenomena. And I point here to the term um, nemotope, which was coined by the great cultural historian Jan Asman for places of memory. And I think it's a very helpful definition because it describes physical places where one can have a historical experience because there are narratives being told at those uh, places. Now these nematopes can be man-made structures, they can be natural landmarks, they can even be empty spaces, but 
one thing is important, they have to be specific. So they should in some way be confined in order to be classified as a, as a nematode. Only when you have multiple nematodes in a certain area, then you can call that a memory landscape. And that's of course what applies to the Battle of Plataea and in, uh, to other ancient battlefields uh, as well. So they are collections of nematodes. Now it has also been observed that memories and the narratives often densify in, in, in a spatial sense. And I call that process spatial densification. And that comes in two major types. And the first type is clustering, which happens when you have chains of nematopes in the landscape where you can literally have a trip down memory lane. But there's also the related but distinct phenomenon of accumulation, which occurs when a single place has more than one narrative attached to it. And that is in, well, with the Persian Wars, what you often get, you get mythical narratives and historical narratives coinciding in the same locations. Now, as anthropologists have pointed out, um, nematopes, they don't always use that term, but the things that uh, are equivalent with that, they are very important in local histories. So these kinds of places function as rhetorical tools for local communities to point out their history. And I would like to mention a very enlightening study by Maus Azaryahu and Kenneth Foote of 2008. And this article, and later they also published a book, and they basically argued that uh, topographical narratives uh, can be simplified into uh, collections of particular anecdotes, which are enhanced by using uh, pre-existing dominant buildings and landmarks. And this can distort the historical truth because the story uh, gets wrapped around those, those landmarks. With that, uh, let's move to Plataea itself and to the battle which took place in the plains between uh, the city of Thebes and Mount Kithairo. I would argue that the topography within Herodotus's account can be explained as a concatenation of nematopes in this, in this landscape. And we can do so by zooming in on the various landmarks that Herodotus mentions. And these landmarks that are listed here have been the focus of people like Kendrick Pritchett who have been um, hiking the battlefield in order to retrieve where they... Now, for reasons of time, I cannot discuss everything. I would like to only briefly mention uh, the ones in bold, which are the Gargafia Spring, the Temple of Hera, and the Temple of Demeter. First, Gargafia. After the initial phase of the battle, when the Greeks were at the Oak Heads Pass, which you can see in this slide, they thought it fit to move their camp to a new position closer to ancient Plataea. And this position was, according to Herodotus, marked by two landmarks, the so-called Gargafia fountain and the shrine of the hero Androkratis. This is what he says. So they thought it best to go to Plataea and to the Gargafia spring and to camp there according to their battle order. They positioned, uh, positioned themselves by tribe close to the Gargafia fountain and the sanctuary of the hero Antocrates across um, low hills and flat land. The location of this area has been sought primarily on the basis of distances from other landmarks. And it, of course, yeah, it has to reflect a water source in, in the landscape. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the hydrology has, has been changed considerably, but nevertheless, many sites have been proposed. And today there seems to be sort of a consensus or there was at least a consensus that the so-called Red Sea Spring in, in the middle of the fields is the best identification of the, of the Gargafia Spring. But I put a question mark there because it is all very much up for debate. The location of the uh, shrine of Androkrates depends on the location of Gargafia and on interpretations of a passage in Thucydides, who also describes that shrine as a landmark used by the Plataeans on the way to Thebes. And again, there are many options, but if we take Red Sea as uh, Gargafia, then the nearby low hill where now this wonderful modern church of Aios Dimitrios uh, stands in a grove seems to 
the best option for the location of the shrine, even though no ancient material has been has been found here. But there's this idea of continuity of cult in the in the in the landscape, perhaps. Now, some early scholars believe that Herodotus's focus on Gargaphia seems exaggerated. But I think that's precisely what uh, we should recognize uh, or why we should recognize its potential as a nematope. And I want to mention also that springs are often landmarks in battle uh, narrative descriptions. And the relevance of Gargaphia lay in its demarcation of the beginning of the battle. One story is explicitly localized at Gargaphia, the blocking of the source of water by the Persians. And um, that story was already known to Aeschylus and to Plutarch and to Pausanias. Well, the historicity of that is, well, I would say unprovable, but people have said, well, it could have been inspired by the drying up of, of this Gargaphia source. Another interesting aspect of that is that you have this idea of or notion of the Persian sneaky behavior, which is something that um, we find in all battle narratives in Xerxes' invasion, where the Persians do something sneaky to, uh, in the end, defeat the, the Greeks, which, of course, in Plataea didn't happen. In an interesting example of this accumulation process that I talked about, the Gargaphia spring later on also became a mnemotope for the myth of Actaeon and Artemis. Actaeon had seen the goddess while she was bathing in this uh, spring and was then turned into a deer and devoured by his own dogs. Now, this is a later development, but I just wanted to mention it as a side note, showing that these landmarks get reused and that they get multiple uh, stories attached to them. We move on, because as the raids from the Persian cavalry continued all day, many Greeks retreated to the temple of Hera in front of the city of Plataea. Having decided to retreat to the so-called island, they were bothered continuously that whole day as the cavalry remained close. Most got up and changed positions, but not to the place that they had in mind. They arrived at the temple of Hera. This is in front of the city of 20 states from the fountain of Gargaphia. And when they had arrived, they placed their arms in front of the temple. This temple of Hera was um, still extant in the time of Pausanias, the, uh, the traveler, who calls it worth seeing because of its size and its beautiful sculptures. And it appears to have stood inside the city at the time of Pausanias. Now the uh, site of ancient Plataea itself is clear. Extensive ruins are located northeast of modern Plataeus, uh, Kokla, as it was formerly known. The location of the Temple of Hera has been identified with an archaic temple immediately southeast of the old part of the city, but it's uh, not visible in this, uh, in this photograph. The observation that pre-classical Plataea was limited to the northern part of the later town makes it possible that the Temple of Hera is within the current borders of the ancient site, as Pausanias' account also suggests. However, the identification remains uncertain because there is also um, a prominent temple of Athena Aria in Plataea, which was a place where votive offerings of the uh, battle were uh, deposited. Now, it appears that the temple was regarded as the next station of the Greeks during this battle. And in this case, the nematope also inspired stories about divine intervention. It seems that the Temple of Hera represented the idea of the refuge, and that's an, a kind of place, a, a kind of nematode that uh, also features a lot in these battle narratives. And Herodotus has remarked that the Athenians put their weapons in front of the temple suggest that Hera herself had protected them. On to the climax of the battle. After more turmoil, the Spartans and the Tegeans halted at a place called Argiopion, where there was a temple of Demeter, of Eleusis. And here, as they were being besieged by the Persian army, the Greeks performed sacrifices. Then, in a dramatic turn, Pausanias turns to the temple of Hera to invoke the goddess. So he's invoking uh, Hera all the way from the other uh, side of the, uh, of the battlefield. And then, after that, the Temple of Demeter turns into the place where most of the fighting takes place. And uh, the Persian general Mardonios is then killed there. 
Although this final stage of the fight had taken place near the temple, Herodotus notes something very interesting. It is a marvel to me that no one of the Persians who fought near the sacred grove of Demeter appeared to have entered the sanctuary or died within it. Most fell around the temple on profane ground. But I think, if one may think anything about divine affairs, that the goddess herself did not allow inside those who had put fire to her holy palace in Eleusis. The location of the final battle also happens to be the most contested. According to Herodotus, the temple was situated at 10 states from the Gargaphia fountain, so that's about two kilometers. Perhaps the most convincing location for the temple is a site to the west of the Pantanasa ridge near a well where temple remains were reported allegedly and also two inscriptions mentioning Demeter were, were found. And both refer to votive offerings to Demeter. But as you can see, this is today just a plot of land and the identification of the temple with this site has also been challenged and the most important alternative is again this place of the later church of Aios Dimitrios, which I just mentioned as the possible location of the shrine of um, Androcrates, which just goes about to show how difficult it is to locate these, uh, pinpoint these places on the, on the map. Now, if Aios Dimitrios was the site of a Demeter temple, then uh, there would be a very interesting onomastic continuity uh, from Demeter to Dimitrios, but that's something that people have said, but that I think is a nice thought, but it is impossible to prove. Wherever the temple was, the idea that it was the climax of the battle, of course, has to be a simplification. The fighting with even a fraction of the figures that Herodotus gives us can only have taken place in a much larger area. Nevertheless, we see that the battle is here condensed into a single spot. How did that happen? It has been proposed that the battle Tropion or trophy mentioned by Plato and Pausanias was set up at this temple. And if this is true, it could show that the temple of Demeter retained its status as a climax site of the battle, because trophies were usually set up at uh, the place where the battle was decided. Because this word comes from trepo, from to turn. So this is the place where the battle turns in favor of the Greeks or the Persians, the Greeks. However, there are some other conceivable locations for that monument. Despite attempts at a rational explanation uh, for what had happened in that passage by Herodotus that I just cited, Herodotus' story um, about Demeter's anger shows that a mythification process had um, enveloped the temple in the post-war period. The divine intervention of Demeter is found in various other sources, including in Simonides' Plataea elegy, and showing that the story was wider than uh, known than though not necessarily independent from it, because we know, of course, that Herodotus knew the work of Simonides. The local perspective of the divine forces of Plataea, not only Demeter, but also Hera, and possibly Androcrates, is also uh, apparent in Thucydides, where the Plataeans, in a speech to the Spartans, much later in 429, dwell upon the importance of the local gods and the heroes who govern the land of Plataea as protectors of justice, and therefore of the outcome of local battles and of um, Plataea's independence. And as a response, this, the Spartans even directly invoke these gods. Now, another question is perhaps, why was Demeter deemed so important? Deborah Buttaker has observed that a narrative traditions about this goddess appear in all major Greek victories during the Persian Wars. And Maybe Demeter was so often associated with battle sites because of her primary qualities as a wrathful force, a true mother earth who was a guardian of the Greek land. Now, a final mnemotopical point, if I might call it that, that I can only touch upon now is the relation of the Battle of Plataea to that of Nikale, uh, allegedly fought, uh, fought on the same day as the Battle of Plataea. Herodotus informs us that good news from Plataea reached the Greeks on the other side of the Aegean, on the very same day, by divine intervention, the Athenians discover uh, a curriculum, a herald staff, on the beach, as if Hermes or Iris or another messenger god had brought the news from Plataea. 
Now, between the Battle of Nikale and Plataea, there are uh, actually many topographical parallels. So again, we have a temple of Hera there, which mean, features as the meeting point of the Greeks. There is also a palisaded Persian fortress that I didn't go into now for Plataea, but uh, they are a uh, feature in both locations. And again, there is a Demeter temple at Mikale where the climax of the battle takes place. Now, it is possible um, that the localization of the battle was drawn to the temple in post-war traditions to facilitate notions of divine intervention and vengeance. I hope that this rapid exploration has shown that yes, we can find with uh, difficulty, but we can try to locate the places that Herodotus mentioned. So Herodotus describes a real landscape, but does that mean that we can fully understand the battle in a spatial sense? Probably not. I think that the topography of Herodotus' account of the Battle of Plataea was densified into a series of nematopes around which stories crystallized. And the different positions of the Greeks were then concatenated into a series of points on the map. Another thing we see is that Plataea's temples and shrines were not only places where historical events had allegedly occurred, but there were also the abodes of ancient forces in the landscape, nematopes of past atrocities. Most of all, I hope to have shown that topography is not only asking where did it all happen, but also where did the Greeks think that it happened and why? And I would say that exciting answers to those questions are possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed. We have, by my reckoning of the clock, we're about five minutes before we ought to be starting the next paper if we're going to stick to the to, to the formal timings. So does anyone have immediate questions or observations they would like to make? I mean, the paper produces the slightly dispiritingly ironic conclusion in a sense that precisely those things in the narrative that give you the sense that the, the, the story was tied to a real three-dimensional landscape are the ones that make it suspect. <laughs> but, um, I'm very sorry if that's the, the, that's the sense, but it's, huh? yeah, I, I guess that it's, it's one way to think about it. And I, I, I think I need to stress uh, again that I, I am fully hopeful that, you know, that we find more traces of the actual battle because of course there was an actual battle. It's just the, the, the we have to think very closely about how to get there and what kind of information leads to what conclusion. Yeah. Meg Miller has a question and then Hans. Meg, can you un unmute? <laughs> I'm so sorry, baby yeah. mistake. I, I, I'm trying to remember, I know that, that, that there has been modern soil deposition on the plane. But I don't recall knowing if anyone has seriously tried any magnetometry reading of the plane for concentrations of arrows or whatever. Well, I, I it's it's some time that I did this uh, research, and I'm not maybe I've missed the recent the recent uh, years where more research has been done on this uh, this kind of stuff, but. I'm not aware of any kind of interesting results coming out of archaeology from that perspective, arrowheads and so on, which was a bit disappointing. I thought there would have been more, but maybe maybe I'm not no longer up to date. So if anyone knows more about that, then uh, please do inform us uh, about that. And but what is interesting is that this, in other battles of Xerxes' invasion, the same thing has been done. In uh, of course at Thermopylae, there has been having excavations by Marinatos. Well, the, the Acropolis, that's, that's a whole topic in itself. The, but on the whole, the, the, the actual sort of material evidence of, of these battles has been very meager. And well, I can, I can also mention the, the sea battles that have been, that, that were just invisible, basically. I mean, people have tried to, to scout, you know, the, the, the sea baths around Artemision and Salamis. 
yeah, maybe some other people can uh, can inform us more about uh, the latest on on the on the archaeological perspective. Hans, I think, was next, and then Yanis, but we need to be quite quick. Just uh, speaking very quickly to your frustration about not actually being able to pin down the exact site as a GIS site, whatever. Uh, I want to thank you for this fantastic talk because I think you have actually led us to this place. That's it. And that's about as precise as you can get, given an encounter as large as this one, just recalling what Paul Cartlett had said earlier, and that went on for several days in preparations, movement, shifts, exchanges, remodeling, etc. This is the area where this had happened. And I really like the way you disentangle Herodotus's narrative from topographical questions as to where these places were. Perfect. Herodotus needs place. He needs real concrete locations in order to make his narrative work. Without those places, the narrative would be just up in the air. So in that sense, I'm not worried at all that these places have a twofold feature or, or two faces to them, as it were. One real, one narrative. And it happens in that triangle. I'd be, I'd be very curious if we had a coffee break here together standing in, 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 in Washington or somewhere else. I would ask you about the several rivers and the island and all these things, which all fall into that same rubric, right? Real plays and imagined by Herodotus as he hears about these things and writes about them in Sicily or elsewhere. So thank you. Well, thank you. And yes, I, I wish we would, would have been able to have a coffee break and, and discuss all of those <laughs> other sites as well. Maybe just yeah. one thing and then we can go to the, maybe to the, to the other question very briefly. The, 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 the river, the Asopos River, right? That's, that's another interesting um, um, thing because the Persian fortress is on the other side of the Asopos River. So the river becomes this dividing line between the Persian and the Greeks and you can Imagine Herodotus going to the battlefield and asking the locals, you know, what, how did this happen? How does this battle evolve? And then they said, well, the Persians were on that side and the Greeks were on this side. And then, yeah, and uh, all, all sorts of interesting aspects uh, are connected to the hydrology as well. Thank you so much. Okay. Yanis, is your question very quick or shall we hang, hold it over? So the latest uh, yes, discussion. I'll try to be as quick as possible. <clears throat> First, to answer the question about uh, whether new research has been conducted on the field, I've been in contact with the effort of our recently, and I've asked about these things. No such research has, has been done recently. The other thing is that I've, be, I've visited Platea many times. But the last one, last December, I spent three days there roaming the battlefield with two colleagues. And that has been very revealing. If it interests the panel later on the round table, I could contribute photos from the landmarks mentioned in the talk with views towards the other landmarks. Because when you actually are there, it's a... Uh, completely different understanding than when you see it on a map. And photos won't do it justice, but they are complementary to what we just listened. 